All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the actual story of actual play. Here I am with Brennan Lee Mulligan, somehow. Uh, absolutely incredible person, my personal hero in the genre of actual play, and uh, someone I did not think I would land on the second episode. Uh, well, you got you got Rick Perry on your first one, right? Exactly. So there you go. <laughs> Started strong. Uh, somehow... Just leaping forward, I'm... It's crazy to see what can happen with just some uh, well-spoken emails. Thank you again to Sam Reich uh, for, in the beginning, putting all of this together. Um, what a great guy. And Rick, too, what a great guy. I mean, such a pleasure speaking to him. Um, one of the, one of the best, the maestro himself. I'm so glad that you were you were able to get in touch with him because he's yeah. he's uh, uh, he's brilliant. He's a genius. He's, he's amazing. Um, so Brennan, in case somehow anyone's watching this, uh, first of all, and second that they don't know who you are, uh, could you just give like a small intro of what it is you do? Of course, I'd be delighted to. Um, uh, hey gang, my name is Brennan Lee Mulligan. Uh, uh, thanks for listening to Jake's show. And uh, I am the dungeon master and creator of Dimension 20, which is an actual play show uh, on dropout.tv, which is College Humor's streaming platform. Uh, we're a show where a group of comedians, improvisers, and other awesome D&D streamers come together and we do um, tabletop adventures in all kinds of different settings. Uh, uh, set in different universes and everything else like that. Uh, it's a joy and a pleasure, and uh, we've been doing that for a couple years now. Since we launched in in September of 2018, um, and I will say that also that the um, it's been a real joy uh, working with Rick Perry and a bunch of other core cast members. Um, uh, and for again for fans of, uh, of your show that that are listening. Um, we do a lot of like uh, a lot of our shows mash up different genres or entities. You know, we did we did like our first season, Fantasy High, was a high school for heroes, and then we did um, you know like Candyland, Game of Thrones mash up. We've we've done it all, and it's so exciting to be here. This is a show about actual play, and so I want to jump into that real quick. Perfect. Uh, can you sort of take us way back? to the start of Dimension 20 and let us know sort of how it started, how the idea came to be, because Dimension 20, while being one of the biggest, it's not the first actual play, but it's very unique and has its own yes. style. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, very well put. Exactly. We came into the space uh, about, so we premiered about three and a half years ago, and we'd been working on the show for about a year before it premiered. Um, so I got hired at College Humor full time in the fall of 2017. Prior to that, I had been working part time. Actually, my main job at College Humor uh, and at Dropout was writing questions for Um Actually, which uh, is a show created by Mike Trapp, which is like a very fun, nerdy game show. And I was kind of in the periphery of College Humor, the company, um, only socially because I had been running home games. I had one D&D group that had Siobhan Thompson, Zach Oyama, Emily Axford, and Brian Murphy in it. And another, and, and they, they, I knew them through a connection to Siobhan. You know, the, like the, it was like the day after I moved to Los Angeles, it was Siobhan Thompson's birthday party. And Emily Axford cornered me at a, at a rooftop party in, in Hollywood, baby. Uh, cor woo! Cornered me at a rooftop party uh, and was like, you you play D&D. I want to learn how to play D&D. And I was like, oh, sure. Yeah, of course. And I knew Emily because I'd been a fan of her improv team in New York. So we started a group with them. Uh, uh, Incredible. My bud, Lou Wilson, uh, that I knew because I was doing improv with him at I.O. West. We, we were on a team together. Um, he started, he was like, I wanted to teach some of my friends to play D&D. And I started a game with him. And then... Um, Essentially, so five of the six core cast members of Dimension 20, I was playing home games with before I was even working at College Humor. And wow. then, uh, you know, and then College Humor uh, ha did, a, did a round of hiring. I submitted uh, to, to be a cast member. And Jake, I did not get it. I was rejected what? from being a cast member. Huh? I was rejected. 
I was rejected, uh, which is great. Which is just, I love that part of the story because it's like, it's like never give up. You got to be persistent. I because what happened is, I applied, didn't get it, but they said, hey, we know you're a big old nerd. You're like running <laughs> D and D for half the people who work here. Um, do you want to come in and write these questions from actually? And I was like, I will take any work at all. And I went, yes, let's do it. Um, and I jumped in and started writing for him actually. And it was an amazing job working with Mike Trapp was awesome. Did that for many months. And then 2017 rolls around and the way that Dimension 20 started was kind of like a perfect storm of events, which is often how these things work out. So I've been writing questions for him actually. Um, they were moving me to full time because in addition to needing more I'm actually questions, they also still needed, uh, they needed writers for Troopers, which is this big sort of Star Wars parody they were doing. Once again, they're like, Brennan, you are a dork. You will come in and do this sci-fi. You know, you love this stuff, right? And I was like, I do, I love this stuff. And right at that time, Zach Oyama, I think, stepped down to start working on Adam Ruins Everything. So right. Zach Oyama was leaving College Humor to go become a writer for Adam. And a spot opened up in the cast and they had just done a big hiring process. And for you, just so you know, hiring, when you ex accept like those hundreds of submissions, it takes a long time. Like the entire cast needs to like read lots. Of, it's a very, it's like a lot of work to do a big round of hiring. And uh, so the Zach stepped down and they were like, Brennan, we, you know, we already just moved you to full time. Uh, we've put you in some sketches already, jump up into the cast and literally I, you know, that was already like life changing. And then like a week or two after that, they were like, hey, now that you're joining the cast, we're launching this thing called Dropout. We need pitches on like full length shows from like everybody. And uh, as you so, so astutely pointed out, actual play already existed by that time. Like this was back in 2017. So Critical Role, Critical Role, I don't think had gone independent yet. They were still at Geek and Sundry but they were still airing uh um you know they they were actually they had just wrapped up campaign one so there's been this big so like like you know i think i pitched to mention 20 like a couple weeks after campaign one of critical role had wrapped up and i had had my friends talking to me about the adventure zone for years you know like like all my friends were huge mcelroy fans so like podcasting and streaming and all this stuff in any case, um, you know there were other things out there in, in the zeitgeist at that time too. Like like uh, Harmon Quest was sort of was sort of around in the conversation at that point as well. Um, and I went to I was working at the office on a pitch for for what would eventually become Dimension Twenty. And it was I basically was had this like market research document that was like here are these amazing shows in the space that are already doing this. Here's Critical Role. Here's why Critical Role is so amazing. Here's the Adventure Zone. Here's why the Adventure Zone is so amazing. And here here's a little pocket of space that we could do a couple of things differently in. Very much from a like potluck mentality, kind of the idea of like a potluck where you're like. What can I bring that no one's bringing yet? I don't want to bring mashed potatoes if there's already mashed potatoes there, of right? Course. Um, um, so in the middle of making that, like literally as I was making that document, I get called into Adam Frucci's office, who's the head of development. And he's like, Brennan, I don't care what you're working on. Put that away. What we need from you is an actual play show. And I went, <laughs> I went, uh, are you, where, where, and I, <laughs> and I, Turned it around and, uh, uh, you know, the, um, yeah, I, I turned that around and put the the laptop in front of him. And I said, look what I'm working on. And it was truly this like zeitgeist moment because that, you know, it was very clear that there was something in the air around actual play at that time. Hmm. And especially for Dropout, where what Dropout wanted to do was create as much content as possible that featured its cast, because the cast of, you know, the brand is so built around the cast. Um, and and actual play, you know, we, we like, Dimension 20 c could put a lot of production value into actual play with amazing minis and great editing and great shooting and all this other stuff, but still fundamentally have a show that was um, easier to produce than like, you know, making a full length movie every week, right? It's like everything is shot in one location. You have it at one studio. You have the same cast week to week. So it's like, um, it, it just was a very attractive uh, opportunity for Dropout at that time. That's um, insane, but in a good way. <laughs>
I'll never forget the feeling of being like, you want me to do what? I'm doing it right now. I'm already writing it. Like a, like a cartoon. It's like, <laughs> I, I, I pop out. Yes, exactly. Um, amazing. All right. Uh, next question here is, uh, I, you know, I talked with Rick Perry about sort of the, uh, a lot of the behind the scenes, but what I didn't get to talk really uh, enough about with him was sort of the production. So when you and Michael Schaubach and Rick, you work together, how, how's the workload sort of separated? How do you guys work around producing a season th and who else is working it's with you and stuff like that? It's such a collaborative environment. It's re it's so so fun, and like without the creative team, the, the 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 doing this job would be impossible. So, early conversations that we tend to have um, start with um, the creative team and start with getting our brain trust together of amazing people that have worked on many seasons of the show. Some of those people are full-time employees of Dropout. Other people are people that are themselves, like have their own careers in Hollywood and spaces like these. Um, and, uh, uh, we're just lucky enough to have come back season after season. Um, generally speaking, the big creative people that we go to from season to season are, Orion Black, our creative director. Um, Rick Perry, who is our production designer and creative producer. We go to Michael Schaubach, who's the show's director. Ebony Harden, uh, who has produced so many seasons of the show. She's enormously talented. Um, and then, of course, we have like our the kind of like executives and people like that, which is like David Kearns, um, Kyle Rohrbach, um, uh, Sam Reich and Andrew Bridgman. Um, but essentially, the people that really start to break a season, and it's different for side quests. So we've had guest GMs come in, and that process is a little bit different. But generally speaking, the creative for a core season, while we're shooting previous seasons, I'll often have a little idea kicking around. And I'll normally, you know, maybe I'll like, grab dinner with Orion after a day of shooting or I'll like be talking to Rick in a meeting and I'll say hey I have this other idea kind of kicking around so there'll be like little bits and pieces of conversation and then we'll have our first big meeting where we say okay I think we're doing idea x and hmm. we immediately jump in so and, you have sort uh, of a you have sort of a portfolio of potential season ideas that you pull from when it's time to make yes. the next one when it's time to make the next one, exactly. And often there will have been one in my head that is kind of like, by the time we have that first meeting, often there's one that's like a little bit of a front runner, but other mm. times it'll be like, hey, here's two ideas I'm equally excited about. Um, which one Which one are we more into? And by the way, by the point that we're kind of like deciding to, to pick one or the other, I usually also will put a Zoom together or put a, put a meeting together with the core cast. I'll ask the cast members like, what are they hey, wanting? what are we, yeah, what are you in the mood for? What do you want to come play? So it's very collaborative. And we want, you know, any idea that we do, we want the whole cast and crew to be excited about doing it. And for me, who I and I feel like the luckiest person in the world. It's you know we've gotten to do so many cool things that generally speaking, I'm very open to what people are excited about as well. Because if we have more than one good idea, we just do the other good idea next. You know we've done that before. There have been ideas that we've been excited about, but like for one reason or another didn't do that had to wait for like a year or two years, and then that idea's time comes along and we do it then. Yeah, I mean absolutely great answer. I I think what me and many other Dropout uh, Dimension 20 fans love so much about the show, but one of the many things that we love so much about the show is that you guys are so diverse. You do so many different things, you know, you have uh, silly, goofy gags and gaffes, and then you also have heart-wrenching, um, you know, soul-destroying moments that really just hit you right in the feels. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's what the beauty of Dimension 20 is. It's, uh, a, a pleasure and an, i feel very seen jake thank you I, thank i'm glad you. i'm <laughs> thank you i cannot stress enough how much uh, <laughs> i'm happy to have you here oh um, man so once one thing i wanted to ask is since your show and most actual play shows is a semi-improv show right like you have some stuff planned out but a large portion of it is improv you're all improv comedians great at it mm -hmm. 
uh, do you ever run into issues with continuity and the story and like someone will bring something up that doesn't fit or maybe you'll forget to say something or include something since so um, much of it is improvised yes we do have so it's it's very rare thankfully and that's a testament to how great our cast is that they're very good at catching stuff um i have my own very extensive notes going into a season and we also work with our editing department so that if we have a break between shooting episodes i might go back in and re-watch the whole season you know episode by episode to so that you know because there are usually a lot of cases where if something gets dropped or there's a continuity error, I can catch it in an episode and fix it in a later episode, right? Hmm. Um, which is very, very good. Now, if we do, if there's a continuity error, which is literally like a contradiction, one of the benefits of the show being edited is occasionally we'll go like, oh, I said the wrong name there. Like a very silly small mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that was just, that's like an incorrect name. And in those cases, we'll often go back and um, we'll either fix it in an editing. And like one of the easiest ways to fix it is just to like cut to somebody else in either ADR, which means I go in and record, record the correct name or the correct piece of information. Or so oftentimes, like, I will say it correctly somewhere else in that episode. And they'll just grab the audio from there and slide it over and all's well. Um, so there's a little, there's like, for small mistakes, for small things, things that are truly just like errors, you can do that easy fix. For bigger mistakes where it's like, oh, I like, we, we dropped this story thread or like something, we missed this opportunity to do something here. That's sort of, you can't really fix that in the episode itself. So you had to do it in a following episode and you'll catch it there. Mm -hmm. That the only place that becomes really tricky is when you're shooting the very final episode. And that one, that one's got to be perfect. So that's so the issue with the final episode is you kind of got to do it all right in that one. So th th those are the final episodes are the ones that I do far and away the most prep for because if you don't catch it there, you don't have another opportunity coming down the track to uh, uh, repair it. Awesome. Uh, I wanted to ask for the show, but also in general for D and D um, or. Yeah, for D&D gameplay. When one of your players comes up with um, a an improvised gag, something, just a funny joke here and there, how often do you think, well, I'll, I'm going to uh, Baron from the Baronies this and really just hit him with, over the head with this later, that this will bring consequences? Or, and how often do you just, nah, whatever, throw away gag? Um, that is, that is an amazing question. I don't know that I've ever been asked that before. That's a really great question. The, so like, what is the internal, like, like what throws the switch in your head between, is this a funny bit for the moment or no, we're going to bring this back. We're going to really do this. And I know exactly what you mean. Now, I think it's funny that you mentioned Baron from the Baronies because I feel like that happened a lot in sophomore year. And as you ask, like, I don't, like, I'm actually thinking of the answer to this question as you ask it, it's a, it's a great question. And I wonder if there was something in sophomore year because it was shot live and we had breaks every week coming back. And because there, there, it was very free from, like we didn't have battle sets. So it was sort of like all theater of the mind because I'm realizing as I'm talking about it, it was like, yeah, that's Baron from the Baronies. And it's also like the Night Yorb is in mm -hmm. that season, which is another random thing that Brian Murphy said that I was like, no, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna do that. Like, I'm not gonna let you get away with that. Um, so I think there is something to the idea of like, the structure of a given season uh, uh, either pr can promote that or make that more challenging. Like the more, restrictive the the shooting structure of a season is like are we shooting the episodes closer together with less prep time um are there more physical sets that we need to get to um that kind of that, that can affect that somewhat but even within those very like tighter structures i think you still have this this idea of um it's often like reading reading the players for me, right? Um, there are certain, there are certain gags or bits that you're reading the players that they are like, that they, they're clear. It's almost like, 
a bit that is more like us at the table goofing around, right? Um, and I think it also has to do with like in the initial bit, in the initial goof, how much passion is there? So mm. this is a little spoil. This is a little spoiler for for the, our most recent season, a Starstruck Odyssey. So fans have been warned. I'll put a little thing in the front. Little thing. So for spoilers, Emily Eisford in a Starstruck Odyssey. <laughs> was obsessed with one thing and one thing above all else, and it was whether or not Loose Duke was on the ship. There was a Isn't random this? NPC, and and this is, I'm gonna use, this is a, a, a wild word to use, but a Star Trek Odyssey is technically the type of story that it is, is, is a picaresque, which mm. a, a picaresque is an old word for basically like a road trip movie. It's a movie where the main characters, so like, Don Quixote is like a very classic picaresque, but so is like Alice in Wonderland. It's like the heroes are moving through a universe from like in, in Star Trek's case from world to world. So Loose Duke is, was not ever meant to be a substantial character. He's just on, he's on one of the worlds that they travel to. And you know, they're supposed to kind of meet a bunch of people as they go from world to world. And, uh, but man, Emily just cared so much. So I think for for like DMs that are listening to this, my the the little gremlin in my heart, the little <laughs> creature that that like my little sense of chaos is is very governed by how much did you care about this? Like how much like how much are, is there like the more passion that a PC is injecting into something, the more I feel like I am I am must, I am responsible to like bring that bit back. Yeah, consequences are the name of the game. I mean that that is the spice. And, and funnily enough, it's like it's like that really even people that that are like, oh man, like why why am I getting consequences? Everyone knows deep down that that's what makes the game satisfying. Because why else would you play, right? Of course, like, right. It's it's a mm -hmm. Sure, there are some players that want to just um, isekai murder hobo their whole way through the whole thing. But I would say, generally speaking, the average D&D player wants to have a realistic world with actions and consequences. So, I'm 100%. Uh, so, for you as a uh, DM, a professional DM, which is you know something that not a lot of people can call themselves, is it more important for you to play with good players or people you hang out with or sort of people you vibe with, I should say? Like good people or good players? What's more important for a professional wow. DM? That, uh, Jake, I gotta tell you, man, these questions are amazing. I, the, the, it's just, I've, I've done, I've done a lot of interviews and it's very, I, like these, these are questions that are so interesting to me um, because they really get to the heart of like what what this is, like what the, what this art form is, or what this like game is. Um, that's well, a, that's you. an amazing, yeah, it's, it's an amazing question. Um, uh, so I would say, because uh, I know exactly what you mean, right? There are some people that are incredibly talented performers. And then there are people that you actually just like love spending time with, people that you are close to or vibe with in that way. I would say for me, I, number one, am, live in a state of bewildered gratitude at my absurd good fortune, right? Being able to be, be a professional DM is is a, a, a laughable, I, I, I am constantly stunned at the, the good fortune of my own life. Um, and, Thing, and part of that good fortune is with like the core D20 cast, I don't have to choose. Like the, it, it is very, I am very aware that like these are six people whom I dearly love and who are also the best at this in the world, right? Yeah. Um, so that is a gift. However, to, to answer your question about like, like even like growing up playing the game, I actually think that... <sighs> In terms of in terms of D and D, in terms of Dungeons and Dragons, I would always love to to play with my friends, right? Mm -hmm. But also, I have played with people that I dearly love. That um, I play with people that I dearly love. 
that weren't having a good time playing D and D. Like sometimes I've tried to like teach family members or friends that are just like not that interested for one reason or another, who are people I dearly love, but the game is not necessarily for them. And on the flip side, there have been people that I've played with that maybe like when I started playing, I didn't know them. We were meeting for the first time, and through playing the game with them, I go, "Oh, this person's a killer. They're amazing." And you actually like, I, for example, I just played um, on uh, on Critical Role with. Luis Carrazzo, who is the first, I literally, you know, I met him, we got coffee one time and then we played and he's like, now I'm like, oh, I love you because he's just so good. Um, and in playing, I got to see how amazing of a person he is, right? So I would actually say going between is the vibe with you good or are you an amazing player? Here's how I would break that down. And it's almost like the answer for me is in the middle of those two things. Because what it's really about is you can love someone and you can like them and think they're cool to hang out with. And if d and is not their bag, like not their thing, then it's then it, it will, there will still be like friction. And on the mm. flip side, on the flip side, if someone's an amazing player, I feel like you can have a great time with them even if you guys don't have a lot in common necessarily or are not close buds to begin with. Weirdly, I feel like the vibes don't necessarily need to exist between the DM and the players as people. See if you can follow me here. It's, it's more about if both of us are vibing with the story we're trying to tell. Absolutely. I completely understand what you're saying. Uh, I Yeah. I mean, I, I've experienced this uh, myself where I've, I've played uh, D&D with some people that I have absolutely no idea who were beforehand because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, my friend was DMing and mm -hmm. now we're on our, uh, we're entering our third campaign together and we're, you know, good friends. So yes, absolutely, absolutely incredible. Oh, I love it. So I wanted to ask, um, uh, it might be a difficult question. You might, uh, you might not have too much to share here. Uh, but I want sure. to ask if you had any standout moments from the show you'd want to share with uh with me and with uh, the people who might end up watching this yes 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 okay i'll do one from the first season i'll do one from the last season these are these are the two that just jumped to mind so so i think that there is a moment in the on our and it was on our very first shoot day of dimension 20 ever we were shooting episode one, we were shooting episode one and two on the same day. So of, of the first season of Fantasy High. Also something interesting for folks, this is like a little, a little trivia tidbit. Earlier that day, I had shot the first CEO sketch for College Humor. So there was one day where I went to work at the YouTube space in, uh, in LA, shot the CEO sketch, which was my first College Humor sketch as a full-time cast member the first sketch i wrote that i got that i got to make and then which like blew up and then later that day shot episodes one and two of dimension 20. it was in hindsight what a crazy day of truly crazy day um long day huh long day <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, honestly, an incredibly long day. Why did they make me do that? That was such a long day. That's so, that's crazy. Don't make me do that. I was, yeah, I was like working from like 8 a.m. To, to midnight. Um, it's like a 16 hour day. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, end of that second episode, and this is, this is, you know, spoilers for people that are not in the Dimension 20 fandom yet this is basically like the episode two people, people there's like a meme about getting episode two um in mm -hmm. in fantasy high freshman year uh because spoilers two of our pcs died in the very first battle two of our pcs were dead it was our first time playing 5e a lot of the cast didn't have familiarity with the system i made a combat that i thought was pretty balanced but you know a lot of the pcs spent a lot of time jumping on tables i did make it a very hard encounter <laughs> There was just a, it was, it was a combination of, oh. I made, a, I made an encounter that was a little bit too challenging and the players were not playing super optimally. And I think they also didn't get that. I was like, that this was like real D and D. They were like, well, it's a show. Like I've talked to Lou about it and he was like, I didn't think you were ever going to kill us. Like <laughs> I thought we we're like making TV. And I was like, no, you got to fight. I'm, I'm coming for you. I'm going to kill you. Um, I'm going to kill that dog. I'm going to kill, <laughs> I'm going to kill that dog. Exactly. 
Um, bad so guy Brendan with, Lee Mulligan. Yeah. Yes, I'm all the bad guys. So uh, uh, with uh, in that in that first episode, that first episode where two PCs were dead and the cameras are rolling. Um, for, for people that haven't watched it, I had to figure out a way to make those deaths matter. Hmm. But but also give us the ability to continue moving the story forward. We couldn't have two PCs be dead and off the show in the second episode, right? And then immediately, uh, two classmates walk in and oh, new new PCs. Eh, new work. PCs doesn't work. So uh, so I figured out a way to improvise my way out of there and had to just pull that out of my butt. It was just it just was something that. It was a great scene. You know. I mean, you you could have sat you could have sat there and lied straight to my face and said that was all planned, and I would have fully believed you. And it, uh, it a life was, for uh... a life for a life, as <laughs> insane, absolutely <laughs> ridiculous scene, but a ridiculous scene. But it, it so to good. me so good. You know, after after that ending, talking to the cast and talking to like Adam and David Kearns and Michael Schaubach and, and different people, it just felt like that moment on that first shoot day that I was I was like trying to fix a problem and and in fixing it I was like okay well at, I think we're doing something that nobody else is doing I think this is you know like I think this is going to this is that we've got a shot right mm. and um uh of of just how wild that scene was so that was the, that's a moment to me that was like okay we've done something here that feels like we are bringing something to the potluck. Right. And then all the way to this last season moment really stands out that I don't know if we, if there's a little second of it in the BTS mini doc on dropout, um, but we got to adapt my mom's comic book series. And there was a moment when we wrapped when Michael Schaubach called rap at the end of that season and uh, a bunch of the cast and the crew got up on on their on their chairs like Dead Poets Society, like stood up on, on their chairs and gave a big round of applause to my mom, um, who is a, a brilliant genius. And it was a you know, my mom was the comic book author of this amazing science fiction universe. And we got to adapt that universe and play in it for a season of the show. And um just everyone just go read uh starstruck odyssey by lane lee and mike Palua. it's uh absolutely incredible mm -hmm. uh, go read it now absolutely uh uh it's i yeah it's great it's an amazing series of graphic novels and getting to adapt starstruck and getting to bring it into the world of dimension 20 was just unreal yes. um I think and that did, mom i think you guys did a really good thing by uh introducing all of your fans to it because i you know unfortunately hadn't heard about starstruck before a star star got to see and now i love it so i'm so glad that makes me so so happy uh yeah it was great because you know like it was very cool to 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 have our little world of actual play and bring this graphic novel series to it and and kind of you know mix those communities together and um but yeah that moment of of a big a big round of applause for the 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 right tricks herself you know mm -hmm. mom the, the 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 author of of anarch era it was very special the author of friendly mulligan the author of myself yes exactly incredible uh, how much you know i i, I know someone as uh, as humble as yourself might feel awkward talking about your successes but uh how much do you think dimension 20 as as one of the biggest actual play shows in the sphere has contributed to the growth of the actual play genre Wow. Um, well, thank you again. Thank you for for the the kindness within that question. And um, and you are right. I, I I it's it's a very wild thing to um, move forward from a place of understanding because it's it's very interesting, right? It's like the the there's a part of me that wants to go like, oh, you know, oh, little old me, but also. Uh, it's important to understand how successful the show has become, especially when we're thinking about like taking care of our crew members, taking care of our staff, like, you know, uh, our show's responsibility to the space and towards like storytelling and and casting and everything like that. So it's very much I think, you know, there's it's important for us to remember that the show has become bigger and bigger, uh, especially when it comes to like how we take care of the space and the sphere and the people that we work with. Um, and uh, 
in terms of contributing to actual play and towards like the, the larger hobby of tabletop, um, it's a wild thing because I think that like you, it's so interesting to watch that from a creator's point of view because you are so clearly working in a vacuum. When me and the players are playing together, you know, the whole world melts away, just like it does when you're playing D&D at home. You get into a flow state, you get into a groove, and time changes, and suddenly you pull your head up from the table and, oh my god, it's two o'clock in the morning, how did we get here? All the snacks are gone, like, oh man, you know, it, it's that feeling. And so it's always really wild to me when I interact with people who will say some version of like, oh, watching, you know, like I was a fan of College Humor before this, and then Dimension 20 turned me on to uh, these games, or turned me on to this other actual play show, and now I listen to NADPOD, and now I, you know, like it, it, all all that sort of stuff of like, that's that's an amazing thing I've seen too, because because Dimension 20 has been around for a couple of years, so you'll see people be like, oh man, like I I love Critical Role, and I like discovered it because I saw Matt play on Bloodkeep, and you go like, what? Critical Role <laughs> was you know like I you'll see that you go like, how did wait how, how did you you found us first you know like and you'll see that because now we you know but I you know I'm in my head I'm still like remembering the fact that critical I was like oh like Critical Role is this amazing show in the the like pitch document for dimension 20 and now it's like years later and uh uh you know we've been around for a second so that's a crazy thing to remember as well um and it is this big virtuous cycle because the people that discover our shows it's like adventure zone nad pod dungeons and daddies critical role uh um, you know all the amazing uh, uh uh into the motherlands um all these amazing streams la by night and that they that's not even DD, right other streams that do other tabletops and people you know there's a lot of reciprocity and mutual respect there so a lot of the our, our fans discover each other um so i think that and there is no credit that dimension 20 i think can take solely but uh, it is very, it is an honor and a privilege to be part of this incredible rising tide of people creating this content and um, sharing this amazing hobby. It's it's a true joy. Uh, jumping off of that, where do you see the actual play genre going in like five years time? Like how big do you see it becoming in the sphere of content that we have to compete with? Wow. Jake, that is... Now, here's the thing, right? So I have two reactions to that question. Number one is five years is a long time. To put things in perspective, five years ago, like like to, to this day, I had just gotten rejected from College Humor <laughs> and, and was like teaching improv and coaching improv in Los Angeles. And so there's an element to the question of like, five years ago, Dimension 20 didn't exist at all. Five years ago, Campaign 1 of Critical Role hadn't ended. Five years ago, I was, five years ago, I hadn't met my fiance yet. Who did, like five years ago, there was no global pandemic. Um, so, you know, like it's, it's an interesting thing, right? In other words, there's a part of me that from a place of both humility and caution is mm -hmm. like, who can say what will be the case in five years, right? Dimension 20 didn't even exist five years ago, so how could I possibly know where it will be five years from now? But I will say, I think that um, the genre and the space will only continue to grow. And I think that it will spread into other forms of media that will create, you know, you see, uh, uh, the, the Adventure Zone graphic novel was like on the New York Times bestseller list for like forever, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Machina uh, just got bought by Amazon. Amazon, yeah, and they, you know, so, 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 and they're, you know, and did incredibly well, like even mm -hmm. performing on, on Amazon, like amongst those animated shows, it did remarkably well. A bunch of people um, who have no idea what Critical Role is watched it and yes, it, so. So it's it's an amazing thing, and I think that that will only continue. Um, so the only insight I can offer from like a, from in the production in the entertainment industry 
is that the entertainment industry right now is really focused on pre-existing IP, right? Mm. It's very rare for a large company to want to spend a lot of money, especially on things that are very expensive, like producing fantasy, like having special effects and stuff like that. Um, it's very rare for companies to want to take risks on things that don't have a pre-existing audience. Um, so to that point, actual play serving as a medium unto itself starts to become really attractive for adaptation because you basically say here's a group of amazing storytellers having an authentic experience together and developing their own fan bases um so oh, i would the not way, there's a thousand billion fans yes precisely do you want to buy the show so i think that we will probably see a I would, to answer your question, I don't know what the future holds, but I would bet on actual play. I think it will increase. I think it will continue to grow. And I think what's interesting right now is there have been attempt by companies to kind of like spin up and fabricate actual play. Um, and what we see is I don't, it's maybe, maybe it's the, it's, it's the pure hearts of the fans right now. But the actual play shows that have tended to succeed have been the ones that were built kind of on authentic camaraderie and joy in the people playing. And the attempts to kind of like fake that, for lack of a better word, or the, or the mm. attempts to like to like snap your fingers and artificially create that, uh, have we have seen and not really succeed that that it's so that's a cool thing in media to look and see, oh, the fans are able to suss out um true joy and and like engagement with the media versus things that are maybe a little bit more cynical so that's a cool well that sort of harbors back to what we were talking about earlier with the uh, good players versus good people question right is that yeah you could uh if you were a big time executive you could sit down uh andrew garfield uh, insert other attractive and uh, popular actor here and make mm -hmm. them play D&D, &D, but if they don't feel like it, and they're, and they're not friends in real life, it probably wouldn't work out very well. Yeah, and you see that over and over again. And also, again, I think you see that thing of, like, there's different forms of vulnerability. Like, you can have somebody who's an amazing Shakespearean performer, but if they feel a little bit silly rolling dice in front of the camera, like, that's going to be a very different thing. Not all performers are, like, equally comfortable in every single medium and it is an interesting thing because you have to find those people that it's being an actual play performer is a very specific thing you got to be comfortable with a very specific kind of vulnerability to be improvising for hours in a row and mastering these game mechanics and on top of that having total trust that you are telling a story whose ending you do not know it's a really incredible way of acting that i think is uh, currently underappreciated by the mainstream and pr hopefully will be adapted more like you said do you think you or and the cast specifically will be doing dimension 20 it, like in these next three five years or do you think perhaps someone else will take over or do you think perhaps the show will simply have an ending I think that we have a lot more adventures left. I think that's the feeling right now. It feels like there still is time. still there's, there's still, still time. time. There's still I can get on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jake. I think there's a lot more time ahead of us. <laughs> Listen, I the tr the truth is this: even if my career were to change, right? Even if I were to start working on a TV show, or if I were to to you know become a father and want to stay home and write fantasy novels all day and and want to be around with my family, that's great. I think uh, it would be a great life. I think that there are, um, I think that there are probably. There's no world where actual play doesn't stay a part of my life, right? Even if I were doing less of it, I think it would be hard for me to, because the truth is this, I love playing d and I would never want to stop playing d and And so there's a thing of like, I'll pro for, for me, I think you'll have to drag me kicking and screaming out of that damn dome. You know, I, I it's just too much fun. Amazing. Um, uh, well, great but, to hear, you know, we, we all yeah. want more Dimension 20, <laughs> so. That's uh, good to hear I, that you're not planning on giving up on it. Not anytime soon, no. Um, 
uh, but of course the future is is wild and unknown so I don't know what shape it will always take I don't know what the format will always be and again I think there's a there are lots of interesting worlds um, uh, and five years is a long time but I think uh, the feeling right now is there are more adventures to come incredible uh, I have some more questions I think we're reaching the sort of ending of what you have what your time is so I'm gonna try mm -hmm. and maybe speed run it a little bit Go for uh, it. Let's do it. We'll keep these answers a little bit, a little bit snappier. Uh, I, you know, I'd love to hear all the answers mm -hmm. you have to give, but I'm, I'm, uh, you know, you're a busy man, so gotta, <laughs> gotta get going. Uh, for my sake, we can do this all day. Do you have any events, things, genres in the place of actual play that you really want to do that you haven't gotten to do yet? Wow. Um, yes, there definitely are. One of them I can't say because it's the next one we're doing and we mm. haven't done it yet. And I'm really, really excited. Um, but I think that there are a ton that are, are really captivating. There are a ton that are, I think are really, really interesting and captivating that I would love to, to tackle. Um, off the top of my head, um, I think that there are... Uh, I think that the the big there's a couple big ones like that we haven't touched on yet, which is do we we haven't done any superhero stuff. We haven't done any like I think mythology stuff, like you know, different pantheons and things like like doing a Greek Greek gods thing could be very fun one day. Um I think we also haven't done um Hit me up if you need any uh, Norse god uh, information. Uh Hell yeah, I love it. That's my uh hope. uh I love it. My mom is on a big Viking kick right now. She's sending me text messages all the time about like, did you know that the that the worshippers of Odin back in the day was actually oh, Odin was a Germanic, and then there were the Scandinavians were worshiping Tyr prior to that, and it's very cool, very, awesome. very cool stuff. Um, uh, but yes, I think there's a ton of fun genres still for us to do, and there's worlds we want to go back to as well. Um, uh, but yes, that, so that would be my answer. There's a couple there's those those couple big genres. Um, uh, and then I think there could be some fun, weird sci-fi stuff uh, to, uh, uh, to come. We did we did like our big outer space adventure, but there's other types of sci-fi that are kind of interesting too that would be cool to go back to. And I mean, Starstruck's far from finished, right? Yeah, there you go. Exactly. There's, there's more adventures to come there as well. I, <laughs> I sure hope. Uh, yes. I think we all do. Because that was an amazing show. Uh, what mm. do you... What sort of tips and knowledge, wisdom can you share for people who are out there saying, man, I would, I want to do what it is Brennan does. I want to be in a position like that. Um, incredible. What I would say is if actual play is a passion for you, like you, that, that is something you want to make your career. Um, number one, um, reps practice just just doing it a lot right uh i i have been playing since i was 10 years old and i played a lot um number two um supplementing the skills in the game with with complementary skill sets so i think improv classes are a huge benefit um to anyone that wants to do it and again it's sort of like you don't need to have the same strengths as a given like you know, Matt Mercer is a voice actor, right? Um, uh, the, you know, a lot of like the Dungeons and Daddies people are like, you know, many of them were like comedians or, or, or filmmakers, right? Um, uh, I think that there's a, you can bring whatever skill set you want to bring to it, but I think having that, that like having a couple strengths that you can lean on is really, really helpful. And then I would finally say, um, to start, you know, like the barrier to enter, like technologically, I think, um, you know, f finding finding the technical way to produce your show. But I think the, the, the main thing to do it is just to begin, right? But, but you know, to, to also like, uh, it, it, it can take a long time for, for things to like build up ahead of steam. So I would say- um, uh, Just get yourself out there. Start by doing it, there. you know. Start by doing it. You will learn. You will learn the more in a single. It's by beginning. Thanks. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Um. Do, 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 do. do you recommend people try and reach outside of their network, sort of the way I did by reaching out to Sam and by you guys and sort of like that? Uh, Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I mean, the worst case, like reaching out and attempting to network, and especially, I think, I think the thing is, do always doing it from a place of earnest, like earnest effort and and appreciation. And again, like uh, uh, this has been a, a joy of an interview. It's been a joy to do. And I think that, like, um, uh, of course. Uh, and I think that there's an element of like you you got to take your shots because the worst case scenario is a no and i think you can make peace with potentially getting a no you can make peace with like hey you send out you send out 100 emails maybe 99 you don't get a response to but um i think it is that that sort of like putting yourself out there is very key um and i think too that in putting yourselves out there there's usually like a right way and a wrong way to do that and i think doing it with a lot of gratitude and humility is always going to be better than being like you know, reaching out to someone outside of your network and being like, boy, do I have an opportunity for you and you better wake up and realize <laughs> like, um, cause I think in general, like, like, you know, everyone's very busy. And so being appreciative of the time and it's, and that's whoever you're reaching out to, whether it's technical people to help you on the production side or it's collaborators you want to work with as you're assembling your team. Uh, and also just for life in general, gratitude is the attitude. Hell yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. If you know, if it rhymes, it has to be true. Uh, well, that's our show, uh, or my show, because for now I don't have a team yet, but you know, one day. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much from just the absolute bottom, top, middle, and both sides of my soul. Uh, I am eternally grateful that you would do this, and of course. Uh, it's a dream come true, really. Uh, so, uh, Jake, an Thank absolute you. pleasure and an honor. This is truly one of the best interviews I've ever had. You, you were so thoughtful with your questions, and it was a joy to participate. That's, uh, well, that's the best thing I could possibly hope to hear. So, <laughs> is there anything else you want to share uh, just before you head off? Uh, uh, again, thank you so much for having me, and and you know for people listening, Dropout.tv, and we got a bunch of free seasons up on YouTube, so you can check out YouTube.com/slash/Dimension20show. Hell yeah. Thank you so much, Brennan, and, uh, you know, hopefully I'll uh, get to uh, see with, see you again someday. Yes, absolutely. Let's, let's make that happen, man. Uh, be well. Thank you so much. Thank you.